and solidarity. Pardon, my, I usually move my neck around a lot. I woke up with the crick neck, but we are gonna work He's getting good. old. I'm getting old. I, I woke up, but I'm getting old. So <laughs> this is what we're gonna deal with. I am your co-host, Joel Whitfield. And I am Nasi Alam. Um, welcome, welcome, thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you um, for having us. Yes, yes, you weren't talking to us. You were talking to your audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Is it yeah. strange for you guys being on the other side a little bit? Little bit, but I mean, <laughs> not I do, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, do so many. Welcome to live. Okay. 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 Yeah, we're also on Facebook Live for a little bit. Um, yeah. So we've been wondering. Actually, we were supposed to have this conversation on Tuesday, June second, which is. Um, blackout Tuesday and so we decided to re cancel the conversation and move it forward to a different day so um, so here we are here we are <laughs> this is Iron Perspective we have been having conversations since COVID started uh, switching before, before well yes yeah, so yeah. we've been we've been switching our conversations since the pandemic hit to really what's going on now mm -hmm. um, and today we have amazing special guests with us that are going to talk to us about what some business responses look like, what some, uh, I'm sorry, what small business entrepreneurship, what does that look like in this, this new wave of crisis? Because this is as much of a crisis as it was a month ago. Uh, we have an amazing guest with us for our 19th episode. I'm so yes. dope. They are, uh, they're super dope. They're going to introduce themselves in a second. And I'm, I'm giddy because before we get into everything, this is what Nussie and I really created Iron Perspective for, is that we could stretch the conversation across business, across social platforms, and, and have these important perspectives. So, yeah. you'd like to introduce yourselves, guys? Sure. sure. <laughs> my by the way, these are my cousins, for those of you. <laughs> well, we're not both her cousins. That oh, would be okay. weird. I'm her cousin. <laughs> <laughs> That would be kind of weird. Let's um, get that clear, right? Yeah. This is not how they refer to each other. <laughs> um, and that's an awesome distinction. I love being Nissy's cousin, but for today, we're really here as two business owners. My name's Iman. My wife said her name's Afreen. And we own a company called Red Elephant, which Afreen's going to tell you about. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we own a company called Red Elephant, and its mission is to empower pioneers, thought leaders, and people who really want to make a difference for communities that are important to them, and not only make an impact in these communities, but also build uh, a movement, a business around it, and make income. So that's one of our phrases is making impact and making income. And the really, the way through is by creating communities. Yeah, and we've been at it since 2011. So we've been in business Oh, not, actually, June 11th will be nine years. It's yes. our nine-year anniversary <laughs> on June 11th. But uh, we've been at it for nine years, and we've helped thousands of people over the years. We've been really fortunate and blessed in our particular niche of our market to really be able to jump ahead early on and serve a lot of people doing a lot of pretty amazing things throughout the world, uh, including you guys. We loved getting to work with you guys while you guys were with us and loved some of the work we got to do. And it was really for us a real privilege and honor to contribute in some small way to this amazing brand you're building and this amazing message and the podcast and the events. And we're just so proud that we got to associate ourselves with it. Yeah, thank you for having us on today. Yeah, excellent. So we're, we're privileged to have you guys on. We, you know, even though Nussie's family, we thought we were going to have to talk to the assistant for three months <laughs> and, and with the login time. Um, but, and, 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 you know, we're laughing and we're being really uh, fun right now, but we, we understand that you guys are really busy and you, you're doing a lot. So to be on the show with us, it really speaks also to the urgency that you've shown in your business about what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we named this episode Allyship and Solidarity because we had a we had a great we had a very successful Iron Perspective event on Sunday, speaking on the current events. It was called Living in Color. We had um, and we had a myriad of people in there. We had all these different faces, we had a different, diverse group of people, very diverse, all races. And what Nussie and I pride ourselves on is holding safe spaces for people to come and be open and be heard. You know? And to have like real dialogue, real honest, open dialogue. Right. Um, and, in, and in that conversation came the conversation, I mean, became the topics of allyship versus solidarity. You know, um, 
what what does that look like for you uh, is there a difference does um <laughs> does one what do you hear when you yeah. hear those words what does that mean and both and by the way you know you guys are married but you guys for sure have different perspectives so we definitely yeah, want to we do. Thank you for understanding that because people often lump us into one brain mm -hmm. and we're definitely not but i'll let you go first sure uh to me this is my interpretation of it i'm not saying it's the right interpretation but uh i think that so uh, us, I can't even say the solidarity. word, solidarity um, represents standing with a cause or an organization or a point of view. And allyship is a little bit more active than that, that people are taking uh, actions to forward uh, a movement and really taking it on as a personal movement to contribute more than just standing with or being for something. So one has a little bit more of a passive statement uh, and one has more active. And I don't think either is wrong. I just think that for us right now as business owners, we have to look at, are we going to stand passively or are we going to be more active? And everyone has a role to play inside of this human condition, right? Even beyond the movement that is on stage right now, we have to think about what is our role because it is going to impact all the communities that we serve and that we lead. So you really need to make decisions. And if you don't, then it's going to leave some of your communities frustrated and sidelined. And you have to get quicker at being able to respond in a way where you can say that you are either one of those positions. Yeah, I will add to that just to have it be a little bit more kind of uh, real for your listeners. Solidarity is like I put up one post on Facebook or Instagram saying, I stand with you, whatever movement that is. Allyship is like, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to listen to people. I'm going to have difficult conversations. I'm going to do what's required that I can do to forward that movement. Um, that's how I would define it distinctly. And just about what Efrain said, I think when you lead people, you know, we're in a business consulting and coaching industry. When you lead people, part of leadership and part of leading people is not just that you lead people when it's convenient inside of whatever you outlined. Like I have a program, I have a service, I outlined it. Now I'm going to lead people inside of my box or my structure and take their money for that. When you're taking money from people, you're taking more than just dollars. You're taking a, a lifetime of education and work that got them to the place where they could afford to pay you. So there's a whole history that they come with when they're investing with you. And you're actually leading that history. You're leading that background of circumstances and experiences that they bring to the table with them. What so I hear is the difference is maybe one is being more comfortable and one is a little bit more uncomfortable. Yes, it's very uncomfortable to lead people in times like this. Yeah. And I, I want to jump in there because even though we're having this almost like interview style conversation, no matter what we do with perspective, we want to remind the people listening uh, when they hear this back that a key part to these conversations is that it is perspective, you know, so uh, uh, a friend and mine, this is their perspective and it isn't law, you know, just as Nussie's is and just as mine is. And, and I say that because in the conversation that we held a few days ago, what you two are saying, it, it was the opposite. So people were saying that's what solidarity sounded yeah. like, and all, you know, so it's a reminder for people to not too much get caught up on the words of it, but what the sentiment is. And the sentiment is one is a passive and one is active, regardless of what so is, what, what yeah, having you know, to find it. if I have allies who are allies with us for, and, and out there on the field, great. If I have people in solidarity out on the field, then awesome, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just want to, just for the sake of yeah, my perspective. You know, see, I just want to say, if something about the way we're defining something is off, we are happy to be corrected. You know, if you hear something that you're like, listen, I actually want you to consider this. We are totally open to considering things. We're in a learning process. We're in a discovery, just like everybody else is. So, And that's part of, you know, some people could say allyship or solidarity is being open to learning, right? Because I don't think any of us have the answers, right? None of us. I don't care what background you are. Um, you know, some people might have more of a voice on it than others, and right? But what is the real answer? There's no definition. There's no clear, like, oh, this, you know, this is the standard that we're going by. Do you have that? I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that, too. 
For those, sure. those are some of the best parts of our our moments when we have events is, mm-hmm. is when people and you see and, and this wasn't to correct you guys at all but it's just something yeah. that rung up in my mind of that's something we lead off events with when yeah. we have people in and it's little things like that that um takes away the edge in conversations you know yeah. this is what we bring to the community this is what we bring to businesses mm-hmm. workplaces when we come in and you just implement small things like this hey your perspective is your perspective for you're sure. not representing the whole you know and things of that nature mm-hmm. right for sure and you wanted to say something yeah yeah i was gonna say i love this exploration because i agree with you nasi that none of us have the exact black and white answers about you know what this definition is but i will say again another interpretation my perspective is that both of those words call forth a question that i think many are exploring is am i am i safe with you Am I protected when I'm with you? Both of those words are going to give clues for people who are feeling not protected, Mm -hmm. people who are feeling unsafe, people who are grieving, people who are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And putting up messages from either term gives some type of message that I am safe, that you can come and have a conversation with me about this topic, and I will hear you. And not putting up a message is also a message. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Being silent is also a message. And so, um, you know, in these changing, for constantly changing times, um, you know, we had COVID, now we have um, the protests, and who knows, next month we might have aliens, I don't really know. But during these times, what does that look like for Red Elephant specifically? What does that look like to be open um, or not open or in allyship or solidarity? What we teach at Red Elephant is we want you to be equipped to handle everything because life is coming at us. Whether you are in control of it or not, you have to surrender to the process that setbacks that are unexpected are going to come and even setbacks that you're planning is is on its way. Doesn't that kind of already happen? But if we can teach things to equip, especially who we're talking to in this conversation at Red Elephant Mm -hmm. is leaders, people who are influencers that can impact circles of other people, that if we can get in front of leaders to equip themselves to respond versus react, to respond in a way that is going to provide a place for assessing, organizing, and providing a place for growth and progress versus oftentimes when we deal with crisis, just think about it. We all go through these different phases. Every one of us, even the most equipped leaders that are experts in resiliency deal with first feeling like you're paralyzed, that you're stuck, that you don't agree, you agree, you avoid. All of these different emotions come, you deny. These are things that are going to happen anytime, any setback. If aliens come, people are going to deny it. People are going to avoid it. We're going to be in this. People are going to put on their antenna hats and go (laughs) running towards it. Right? Some people will embrace it right away. But if you can acknowledge where you are is where you are and start to look at okay, what got me here isn't going to get me to the next place of where I want to move forward in side of pulling my community forward. Because I think that's what leaders are called to do is pull communities, pull people forward. Then I can't remain stuck. If I can't remain stuck and paralyzed, then what are the things that I need to do? Well, we have a process. The first thing that we usually say to do is do some research, ask questions, learn, get really informed so that what you're speaking from isn't reactions based on past base experiences because that is a very limiting place to come from yeah. and that's not going to move you into what we call transformational action and social change so that would be my my immediate response about that is is really being equipped the companies with- right now they're all being put under the pressure of and really being watched right now and how people are going to you know react um yeah. companies have been showing up differently target they just you know they got ransacked but they're like you know what as far as everything's concerned we're okay we're you know still paying our um workers right and they took a approach that's working for them 
Um, right. NFL, we don't know. Their, their approach is still not naming things. People have a lot of problems with the way they're approaching things because they're not actually naming. I can talk for hours about the NFL. I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> right. Uh, um, there's many companies who are really being put on the crossfires of what that looks like. There is no um, time for not taking a stand, right? Yeah, I think it, Missy, goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's that if you lead people and you're willing to take money from people and take their uh, time and take their investment, you can't not lead them when the time gets tough. In fact, that's when they require more leadership than when times are good. And I think when people don't respond, silence is always a vote in the favor of whoever's in power or the majority. So even if that's not your stand or your stance or your viewpoint, that is how it'll be interpreted if you stay silent. Yeah. So I think more than ever, it's necessary to understand that as a business owner, you're a leader. And as a leader, there's a real onus on you to go say something. Right. Whatever right. The something is. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Sometimes, man, you know, during all of this, um, as Nessie and I was always put in to remind of, like, I'm a black man, you know, Nessie's a Bengali woman. And um, a lot of times I'm just processing this. A lot of them processing it and, happen, and seeing it happen. Mm -hmm. um, on top of you guys being super successful business owners, you are both also Bengali, right? Um, and from Bangladesh, uh, from Bangladesh. <laughs> like, where else would you're, you are you're, you're, you're learning. I'm trying to get it. It's you think Bengali would be from India, so that's, that's a good distinction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I've learned, I, I always kind of tie this into even why our perspective was started because mm -hmm. that's the relationship with Nussie and I. It was me learning a lot about her culture, her learning a lot about my culture. We both from the same borough. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Queens, it's like, what is Bengali? What is India? What is what, Pakistan? Where? What are you talking about? We all go to the same junior high schools and high schools. And um, on top of on, on top of you being in the business world and doing these things for your business, you're also representing your cultures and where you're from. How does this look in your cultures now? What do you what are you starting to see uh, amongst this conversation? Um, from my culture, you know, I've, I'm fairly active on social media. I'm fairly vocal. Uh, I've been initiating conversations for the Bengali community to start dealing with our own racism. Because growing up, my experience was that there was a lot of racism, both within the community, towards the community, and from the community outwards towards other ethnicities and cultures. So mostly what I've been seeing is one of two things. Either people have been silent, which is okay with me for the moment, because I understand people have different processing styles and people need whatever they need in order to formulate something to say, or they've been pissed off about the rioting. And talking about the rioting and the looting, which also, you know, it really goads me. It gets under my skin because you haven't said anything about human life. And now you're talking about rioting. It drives me crazy. And those things I've been responding to. And in those responses, one of two things is happening. Either they're going silent or they're arguing. So uh, as a Bangladeshi really committed to my community, and you know, we're from Queens too. That's where the Bangladeshi community first landed in New York when they immigrated here in the early 70s, not far from where Nissi lives. Um, and we're from this community of people who were here in the 70s who are very powerful, very successful. They have access to resources, media, money. And so far, mostly they're silent. But in terms of my relationship to it, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I am and I'm planning to remain like a dog on a bone about it because I'm not going to let it go this time gonna deal with it however we have to deal with it i think um yeah i you know you know me I'm, I'm my own little i've always been my own little um firecracker or whatever you guys want to call me <laughs> um but i think it's time where no one can people can't ignore this anymore our own families um people in the community they really have to take a stand but i also think um a lot of them really just don't, they don't know. They don't know the history of America. They don't understand what has taken place to make people react in the way that they did. Yeah. And it's really an um, interesting thing because our families have all been part of the revolution of even getting our independence. And that was not that far back. That was in 1971. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, our older generations were all alive and they all understood the 
reason of needing to protest and riot and do all of those things? Like what happens? Bangladesh itself was one once under, you know, um, and felt the need to really like come forward and do stuff. So how do we relate those? Born under protest. The yeah. country was born from protest. The country mm -hmm. was born into uh, from, from protest. And Nancy being a history major, is that we always bring this up. I love history. This is how a lot of cultures were f formed. Mm -hmm. This is how a lot of new regimes and societies were formed were from protests. People mm -hmm. are looking at this like we're disrupting a utopia or something. Yeah. And Jarrell, I would say, I, I'm sure Nussi said this in the past for you, but part of the challenge with that, when you have a culture born of protests like our parents, and our parents were very active in that protest and in that war, the undiagnosed PTSD or shell shock, they called it at the time, really does impact their ability to participate now. Mm -hmm. And as children in the next generation of a generation that has that PTSD or undiagnosed or diagnosed, doesn't matter, as the children of those people, we also lack a certain training to get involved in things like this. It's very, it's very out there as something we don't talk about and touch. We, to celebrate 40 years of Bangladesh, we put on a gala. This is like uh, eight or nine years ago. And we thought our parents would be so proud and our community would be so proud that we're celebrating Bangladeshi heritage. We had maybe 50 people show up to that gala. And when we broke down and started looking into why people wouldn't support it, they couldn't deal with their own shock and their own trauma from what happened 40 years ago enough to come celebrate. So there is that sort of layer of what we're dealing with as the first generation of uh, Bangladeshis born in America in terms of participation. Yeah. Um, I also want to make a distinction that, <clears throat> you know, Bangladeshi community is very diverse in itself even in the way that we respond to things. Um, like you just mentioned, you're from the first generation of Bengali. Yeah. Right? I remember back in the days, what is Bangladesh? What is a Bengali? Like that itself, being able to use that distinction, um, that there's a difference. I think there's an importance in even like, you know, noticing that because um, speaking to Bengalis that maybe have immigrated 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they have a very different experience yeah. than we do. Um, you know, the conversation about black and white was very different back in the 70s and the 80s. There wasn't this whole variation of different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, as you, you know, you guys, you grew up in Levittown, Long Island, which is the birthplace of racist Serbia, right? I don't know why our family decided to go and start off there. I don't know what was happening. But we're, we're like, Let's just put ourselves right here. Yeah. It, it shocks me <laughs> when, when I see some immigrants land in America. Like, damn, you just picked this on the map. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, your brother, he was seen, you know, clearly as a black man at one point. Um, I've had this, I've mentioned this to Jarrell before, like, you know, what does that look like when you get beat up for being black? and you're not black right and so like understanding that in this world in this country there is a you're either white or black and i don't think a lot of bengali and a lot of, a lot of other immigrants understand that at the basis of what yeah. all this is right so yeah i mean there's more historical context there that i don't know we if we have the scope of this hour to talk about but you know in there's one thing me and Nussi and Afreen understand is that our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation, as much as they fought their British oppressors, they also idolized them and idealized them and strove to live like they lived. Mm -hmm. So in a culture now in the United States where, and I wouldn't say it's either you're white or black, I look at it a little bit differently. Again, it's perspective. I look at it as either you're white or other. And a majority of that other is black. So a lot of the, that terminology goes to the other, but in my growing up, I grew up in the same town as my brother. You know, I got called uh, the N-word almost every day of my life. It was a regular part of the vernacular in the town I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I don't even think I understood how horrible a word it was until I got to college because it was such a daily part of my routine in the way people talked about black people. When the Rodney King riots happened in LA, I shared this the other day with some people. There was one black girl in my entire school. Her name was Allison White. They tortured this girl. They beat her. They stuffed her into lockers. They stuffed her into garbage bags, into garbage bins. Then they stuffed her back into lockers. And most people, and at the time, including myself, I, I can't lie about it, 
thought it was funny and laughed. Because mm. the, the value placed on her dignity was so low as a black person that that was acceptable. So, I, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I don't want to claim that I know what it is to have a black experience. I'm not black. But I do know what discrimination and prejudice and being bullied and being beat up and being othered is that I think in our company, because we are talking about business and small business, it's given me the opportunity or given us the opportunity to kind of ride both lines. Like we know how to talk to both sides of the spectrum because of that experience. No, I, think, I think we have a privilege, right? Something that we speak about a lot is the layers of privilege. Yeah. Even being able to have this conversation um, and talking about this instead of having to be out in the streets. Some, some people have no choice based on which neighborhood they live in. They got to be out, they got to choose um, to be physically out there, right? So even having that conversation, I think, um, you know, I mentioned, I've had this conversation with Jarrell many times because I am a Bengali American. Even some of the conversations that we have, a lot of people feel like they can say things to me um, more openly than maybe with Jarrell or someone else that's black, right? Because they feel like, okay, well, you kind of understand, right? But I think sometimes they also don't realize that you can say things to me and I'll listen to you, but I'm also going to put you in your place um, of what that looks like, right? I just actually had this, com I had a conversation yesterday um, and I had to really put her, I'm like, I'm saying this to you, I'm like, there's plenty of people that I see that are doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing and I won't bother putting the time and energy into putting, you know, doing all that um, because there's way too much, but I'm going to say this to you because you matter to me. And for me to be in any kind of relationship with you, you have to know that I don't think it's okay, right? And so like, what do you guys feel like, you know, of course there's a responsibility in business, but what's your personal responsibility? Um, knowing the things that you know, knowing that you have an understanding that might be greater than other Bengalis, other immigrants, other business Great leaders. Yeah. So I'm going to answer that twofold. One is I, I just wanted to chime in about the Bangladeshi yeah. American perspective. Um, and what, what I notice is that when our parents immigrated here between the 70s and 80s, that they came here out of survival. And they left a country um, that was experiencing all of this unrest. And in my, again, my perspective, this isn't law, right? But yeah. in, in Bangladesh and South Asia, really there is more of classism which is discrimination against wealth um there is of course prejudices against the shade of color of your skin but the level of racism that exists in america is different than it is in bangladesh because it just it's just different so when they came here from from what my research tells me is that they went into survival even here that they weren't going to get and speak up and be allies because they would feel threatened. And I think that because they retreated from the racial dialogue in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, we inherited that avoidance. And that is why a lot of people haven't become allies, in my opinion, until now. Like we're hearing people that are now educated and making a choice for themselves that really have an understanding of it hitting close to home for different reasons. And this is going to answer your question that we're now the black community is our community. There are friends, there are clients, there are family, there are kids. And when people are feeling or black people are feeling afraid and not protected that's not okay with us that's not okay with us no. so there is a personal responsibility to ensure that we ally with people who don't feel safe because that is an injustice it's a discrimination that we need to pull up all of the resources that i that i have so personally I didn't grow up in Levittown. I grew up in Merrick, New York, where I was the only person of color in my grade. And what that meant is a couple of different things. But what I can say is that I learned at a very young age about white people. Like I was telling him on earlier that I in, internally, I can identify as a white Jewish girl. I, I can talk like them. I can act like them. Oh, I've heard, I've heard this. 
<laughs> and some of my personal color friends tell me I'm I'm too white, right? Because that that's just what I surrounded myself. This guy with. included, right? And I'm really exploring. You know, I wish that when I was younger, I had more of these kind of conversations so that I could really embrace my culture, my skin color, and not avoid it. Because yeah, um, you know, it's a product of where you kind of grew up, right? But, yeah, but now I grew, I, up, I grew up very differently in Queens, New York, and who I was surrounded by. And so I don't know who I think I am on the inside, right? But like, um, there are differences even with Bengalis and where you grew up, right? Like, I mean, because I identify also as a Bangladeshi woman, you know, yeah. I'm saying it's, it's just, you know, I, I, I also have been told I present as Hispanic. So I, you know, the, the, the reactions that I'll get from people um, is, is different, you know, and, but when I go to New Hampshire, I don't present as suspect, you know, there, there's different ways that people react to me, but in terms of personal responsibility, uh, it goes back to since I grew up in a neighborhood where I understand white culture, I feel equipped to be able to educate, empower, and understand, empathize, and hear their perspective in a way that I think can be influential so that they can become allies of a movement that impacts everybody in the United States. This is something that impacts everybody. And I think that often these conversations get ignored. And if I can be somewhat of a bridge or a mediator. I mean, that's what we've been doing for the last, I mean, it's just, it's just helping people that are um, not familiar and like doing all this work. I'm like, this yeah. don't distract the people that are for the movement right you now. You already have an in with them. That's what I'm hearing, right? Yeah. So like yeah. many yeah. times, you know, even Jarrell included, sometimes, you know, you're that friend of people that, oh, like that, I have a friend, you know? Um, and once you have a friend of a certain background, at least they're open to a friendship with you. They're not, you know, completely racist, whatever that is, right? I'm, like, I'm just listening. To you. It's, <laughs> like I'm, it's like I'm in the living room. I have so much to say, but I'm listening. Oh, no, um, we, and we definitely want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm listening. Your living room. Uh, I want to hear what you have to say for sure, and then I have something to add. This is, uh, thank you for those answers, because when, when I started Iron Perspective, the question I was having with Nasu, mm -hmm. um, and we both have different reasons why we started this, but at the, at the heart of it was empathy. You know, what I was thinking about empathy was the empathy for black people at that time, because black lives, black lives matter was really kicking off. And the question for me was like, why is this a black issue? You know, why this is the police we're talking about. We're not talking about some inner beef or something. This is the police that police everyone. Why wouldn't other cultures like just, naturally be like oh yeah that's happening i gotta i have a store down the block let me let me go get with these folks so they don't burn down the store you know and that it just seemed like such a passive like okay well that happened to them again they'll take care of it you know and that was my question coming out of it so freeing the the last response that you gave because we do talk about that history it matters you know me learning about uh the bengali the bengali history and the Bangladesh history with Pakistan and everything. Like, I didn't know anything about that. And so the, how many other countries are coming from that? Like, I understand that. Um, what I also felt and feel is that like, as a black person, like I always have to learn about other people. Mm. We always had to learn everybody else's stuff. We had to learn about the Jews. We had to learn the Holocaust. We had to learn the slave trades going on in all these other countries. We had to learn how these countries were developed. And it was never a reciprocation, it felt like. People who came here and created communities and like, like fed off of us in these communities. And it was never, a, man, why are you guys like this? <laughs> and if it's, to me, it's like, if that question was never asked, then it's already assumed that you guys just are fuck ups. You can't get this together. We're going to come in here and set up. You guys don't know how to do these things. We'll take over as opposed to that. Um, I've always also had that feeling of like, this is the only place that can happen, America, right? Like you couldn't do that in reverse anywhere else where we could go somewhere and just ignore how stuff is going, you know? Um, so it's not that, that that people don't care. And I think that's what Nussie helped me in with building this. So that wasn't the thing. Uh, so what is it? What is it? Like, uh, and for, for that, we had to get two perspectives. And what you guys just did, and that's why I was listening, is sharing the perspectives of different Bengali neighborhoods, different uh, upbringings, 
uh, generational, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the that's that's what I love to uphold when we do this because now I look at this conversation. What does that look like in a room full of Bengalis and Black people who yeah. have lived? You guys know Queens. Uh, we were just ro rolling past Hillside, and I'm like, man, look at all these Bengalis on on this block, and right down the block on Jamaica Avenue, and they're protesting. And the difference of a quarter of a mile really gets small if these guys come up the block, and now they want to. Jamaica yeah. Avenue and Hillside Avenue is not that far. I heard of the worlds, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that goes for all the cultures. We're speaking because we're Black and Bengali right here, but that goes for the Koreans and the Chinese people and everybody. What does it look like to actually, like, um, I think even for myself, what I have got a chance to learn is, even though I am a history major, um, where did I learn history? It was in the school system and the, you know, who l wrote that history, right? There was a level of... Um, there's, there's only a certain of, level of history you can learn in school, and there's history that you get to learn once you come out of that. And you have to somewhat be very proactive in that. And so even, um, you know, I did know some things, but then obviously in friendship with Jarrell, I learned some more things. And I think those are things that a lot of Bengalis do not have the knowledge of because they learned Martin Luther King, and that was about it, yeah. you know? And then... And it's not, <laughs> and it's all, as I always like, say you know, Nussie, it's not so much about us and us and black people and learn our stuff but like we were the we were the ones here this mm -hmm. thing that we're all dealing with racism and stuff like this was here and and it's to focus on the issues that we have is to focus on the issues that all of, all of us have they just haven't gone into the Bengali neighborhoods yet like we know who we're dealing with you know they will come out I, I, I say this with love because I know this place I'm like there's pockets of neighborhoods in here that feel they're safe because they have established business and community and I'm like but, but the bigger threat can come in here and turn tear like the model down. minority right like we just we just saw that well how quickly that can disappear when they think you're gonna infect them with the coronavirus right or prior to that when you're talking about immigration and yeah. then immigration became the it threatens so many more communities now mm -hmm. you know because the, the the people who are forcing the immigration are the same people who are fostering racism you know, it's just two sides of the of the coin. So having these kinds of conversations for me, why why I like having them, what, what I want to bridge is is like it it changes my understanding of even some Bengalis of why would they not get into this? You yeah, know, I want to add one one piece of that. For, yeah, for sure. You know, just unpacking this conversation is that you know I think it really is up to the first generation to be able to voice this. And I think another thing that happened that really plays a huge role in this is 9-11. You know, that we are the first generations, you know, of, of and the older version of that. Iman and I are both in our families, the first American born. Uh, and so what that means is 9-11 happened right uh, after college for us. And when I think a lot of Bangladeshi communities, they identify Muslim first and then Bangladeshi for the most part. They identify with their religion first. And after 9-11, that retreated a lot of people to not be exposed. People that would wear hijabs took off their hijabs. They did not want to be attacked. I know between the three of us, we know many people that got attacked. Now, this isn't to distract from the narrative that we're here to talk about today, but to speak to why we went missing, Joel, is because we got afraid. When we show up, we felt attacked and it was survival again. So we retreated. And now here's another time that we're now really rising up to uh, the conversation from, uh, you know what, enough. You know, I, I, I'm Muslim, I'm Bangladeshi, uh, and I'm here to be an ally for Black Lives Matter. And if that means you're gonna attack other parts of who I am, then that, that comes with my voice. And I'm, I'm more equipped I, that I am now than how I was before. So yeah. I'm, I'm more vocal about it. I think you want yeah, to add I, something. What I wanted to say is I agree with the Freedom's perspective. And I think we could spend a lot of time on the why of understanding why people are retreated, why they're not engaged, why they're not stepping forward. And I go back to just saying that personal, we're talking about personal responsibility. And in personal responsibility, you can have a million reasons for why not. But the thing I think to move something forward is to focus on why too. Why yes? Why do we move forward? You know, as you were talking, Jarrell, I studied pre and post-industrial revolution African civilization in college. 
because I really, it was important to me that I understood why the issues of race in America were the way they were. So one of my professors says, said to me, you need to study pre and post industrial revolution, industrial revolution, revolution uh, history of African Americans and African civilization. So I studied those things and I began to understand the race problem in the United States in a different way. Now, does that understanding propel me forward in a way that it might not propel someone else? Maybe, but the core thing that I think a lot of us, not maybe the four of us, but most people lose sight of is the Black Lives Matter movement, the race problem in America is a human problem. And if you understand anything about humanity, the whys of, or the reasons for why you're staying retreated at this juncture can no longer outweigh the reasons why to engage. Yeah. And the onus in terms of my own personal responsibility is now I have to engage. It doesn't really matter what the cost is. We had two classes where we were intending to sell our programs and a workshop scheduled this week. We scheduled, we canceled all of it just because what there is to focus on is not my ability to make money. Sure, our income is going to get impacted. But that's not more important than the human condition and what human beings are suffering from. And we're in a society that needs to pivot their understanding away from commodities and commercialism and money into what do human beings need. Right, right, right. That's a very powerful uh, point right there that came up as well on Sunday. Uh, once again, for the people listening, people live, we got amazing Sunday dialogue coming up. Uh, we'll put the link into pre-registered down here. Uh, but humanity, humanity certainly surfaced. And I felt as a black person, as a black man, that it, it often hurts when this thing gets muddled down to race. Like we, we know racism. We don't need to champion that and get people to <laughs> believe that exists. What we're really asking for is humanity. It's for a feeling of humanity. To so, feel like you're important. Yeah, and that you matter. And that sometimes, not sometimes, that often comes from empathy. You know, those are the words that we built this company on is empathy. How do we, first it's perspective. We get people to see each other, but there's really no other way to get to empathy yeah. instead of, um, except to really dig to it. You can't just say, oh man, I feel sorry for you guys. I really see that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, of, and what we said, we were like, how do we get to that? We got to put people in front of each other. We have to put people face to face. That's how we started those conversations. They've, they've grown to Zoom conversations now. And now we're looking at what's at the core of a lot of these issues. Yeah. And that's where unconscious biasness comes from. But you guys have been hearing from us and you want to continue to hear because we know that that's a very important part of that conversation of what is the unconscious bias of some Bengalis uh, to step out or again, we're specifying Bengali, this is not the attack. This would be, and we wanna have these conversations with other cultures. Yeah. Uh, speaking from a black person, I know that like, I feel we are also of some of the most loving people, you know, and once we are loved properly in this country, we will be able to mm -hmm. exercise that back, you know? Yeah, what does humanity look like? I just shared an article this morning. Um, there was an Indian man in DC when the protesters were being attacked and pushed and you know all of that he basically opened up his home and allowed 70 of the protesters in people he had no idea who they are and he took the time to actually protect them the police try to still you know do things through the window they try to they hijack the pizza delivery guy because he was trying to feed them um they were promising people that if you snuck out toward, towards the back he wouldn't do anything to you and he's like no he basically sent them away um actively being an ally in that situation right and i don't really know what his feelings are about the whole movement in general but in that moment he's like no these people are being attacked and i need to take them into my home and that's something i've asked people in the past um, um my biggest focus was on the holocaust um i didn't understand like how anything like that could happen and i would just say you know, maybe this is not the Holocaust in the traditional sense of what we think of in, in internment camps, although we have some of our own here. Um, that's a whole other debate. Um, but the common man, what they had to do during that time to help the people that were being attacked. 
and they may have had different kinds of feelings of what everything about was, you know, they didn't have to agree with everything that was going on, but are you going to allow people to be killed in front of your face? Are you really not going to stand up? Like, what's your responsibility in all of that? Yeah, the Holocaust took a world war. People were hiding. I mean, Anne Frank, she was, they were in an attic in someone's home. The people who were downstairs, that was a liability. They they had to really, like, no, like, if you get busted, so do we, right? So, like... Yeah, Nussi, you might not know this, but during the genocide in Bangladesh, during the 1971 war, when they were raping all the women, your mom, my mom, and a lot of our aunts, they had to hide them on an island of another one of our relatives just so that they wouldn't get raped. And they lived there by themselves for almost four months. It's like the things... I think the point is, without getting into the details, is I think we have to transition to humanity first and everything else comes after humanity. Yeah, because with that word humanity mm -hmm. and black people being part of the humanity, if this continues, everything is gonna suffer for everybody. That's my understanding of the looting. I don't, it's not about I support this, it doesn't matter, like it's happening. Mm -hmm. That's why I've been telling people, it's not about if you support looters or not, it's happening. That's the, that's the things to think about. Like, what is this unrest that's actually happening? Um, and I, I think that it's going to keep affecting people's businesses. It's going to affect their storefronts. It's going to affect, uh, now it, it matters. Now we got to be in the house at eight o'clock in New York City. Unbelievable. We, we have an event on Sunday. I'm like, I don't really know how this is going to work anymore, actually. I have a, a, a governor daddy in New York City. And, um, and very quickly, though, the point being that, like, now nobody can get food after eight. I don't care what race you are, what you believe, what your sexuality mm -hmm. is. This is how things affect all of us, you know, be it race, yeah. be it injustice or whatever. So we, we really appreciated having not only your perspective for your culture, but um, what led us to have this conversation really was you guys are making great strides with your business and um, what that looked like now. You know, how is that going to really look for people moving forward? Um, to, to better serve their community. And you guys What's really the impact of that all, right? So yeah. What, yeah, <laughs> impact. yeah, and I, I mean, you, you, know the, you know the term impact. You guys have really coined that. And um, I understand from my standpoint of what solidarity looks like as a Black person. Uh, it looks like we see who says what. We know what sounds like bullshit. We know what a, a, a PR speech is. We know what PR bullshit is, you know? Um, then there's like real active steps. You know? So so we definitely commend you guys for, for doing that within your community. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, tell us how we can support you, where we can follow you, um, what you're going to be doing for the your business community in the near future that's going to propel this movement. Yeah, so I mentioned before that the way to create impact is really through communities. So similar to what you create as a safe space, we also believe in that value that in uh, building something that matters to you, whatever that cause or community that you want to lead or stand for, you can't do it alone. And another phrase we say very often is you can't be invisible and make an impact, that you have to speak up, you have to stand out. And oftentimes what you have to confront when you're about to speak up and stand out is the resistance that comes with it, the fear, the criticism, and the fallout of when you do stand out. So we created a community. It's a free space on Facebook called the Red Elephant Herd. And that is where people that have these conversations, you've been guests on our show in there. We come every morning at 10 a.m. And we have different conversations uh, inside of a series we call Spark. It's social participation and response community. So we're really looking at conversations about what's happening in community and how we're going to respond to them versus react. So that's one way that we encourage people to participate with us. We're also doing a free challenge for people who are really saying, you know what, I'm I need ready. to be making an impact right now. And I want to be more than just somebody that's listening and being educated. I want to be somebody that is really doing the work and conditioning myself to equip myself to lead and influence people. So we have something called the 30 days to impact challenge. And that's a free challenge for people to participate. And it's been incredible. It started just a 
a couple days ago. Yeah. And people are really exploring what their stand is and what's holding them back. So those are just two ways that people can participate in um, free online resources for exploring the conversation of how to build communities, how to make an impact. And also it is leading to creating this sustainability around the impact that you want to make. So we help people monetize in ways that are natural and organic to what it is that you're standing for. Right. And what so, about on a personal level? I know. Um, wait, wait, before, yeah, you, before the personal part, I want to yeah. just add to that to the listeners that uh, what Red Elephant does is really for everybody. You know, we keep saying business and business. I don't want people to think that they need a business. Um, right. You know, this amazing group has scientists, inventors. Uh, rocket scientists. Folks, right. rock, literally, rocket scientists, uh, yoga, dance. Mm, so, us. yeah, for, for everything that they just mentioned. And I, I love them because they helped us turn this idea into something that is just completely amazing. Um it, yeah, it's for everybody. So, so, so we're gonna put the information in in the comments and definitely check out Red Elephant. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So, um, just a on quick personal on, on a personal level, um, what does that conversation look like in uh in the Bengali community in your family, friends? What does that look like? Going I think it's still developing. For me, if I were to make an ask at a personal level, it's really uh, an appeal or a, a summon to people's humanity, which is the time for seeing something and walking away or looking in the other direction. If not before you heard this conversation, then at least now, uh, my request is that you have that be intolerable for your soul. Don't look away. Don't walk away. When there's a wrong to right and you're in a position to be able to you don't have to write the entire wrong, but if you can contribute to writing that wrong, get involved. It'll take courage, it'll take resilience, but if there's one thing I think we can learn from the Black Lives Matter movement and just Black people in America in general is resilience. If you look at the history of Black people in America, every single thing that's been thrown at them for the last 100, 300, 400 years, they've risen up from. And I think we're gonna rise up from this too. And it's a real uh, lesson in how to be resilient and how to be courageous. So do that, you know, look at the thing and do what's right and connect with your humanity in service of people. That's a great word, resilience. We, yeah. and, and we are wrapping this up, but in that last conversation we had, um, there was, he was a white man and he had uh, white man issues of like, white you know, you know, the people are not, they're really not receiving me and I, and I love them and I want to show them love and I want to show them that I love them, but they're not. And we're like, you know, people really like, nobody cares. Hey man, no, everybody's not going to celebrate you for doing what's right, period. Regardless of if it's helping the race or whatever. Uh, but resilience, resilience is, is not a black people thing. You know, we've had to, We've been forced in our ways, but everybody here has experienced that in some way from their culture and how they got here. And it's definitely time for that now to be resilient. Yeah. And so thank you for that. And those yeah. words, you guys are amazing. You know, we love you. We um, love you. Too. You guys are thank amazing. Thank you guys for, for joining us. us. And taking this time out. We understand, uh, again, that you guys have so much work that you're always doing. So thank you for being with us on episode 19 allyship in solidarity bengali perspective <laughs> right, so. iron perspective radio yeah. that is a wrap okay. peace out man. thank you guys yeah. so much stop recording